This episode is sponsored by Tegas. Understanding expert insights is table stakes for investors today, and there's no better option than Tegas. I've been using them for years to get up to speed on companies, and they've helped me immensely as an investor. Tegas also recently acquired both BAM SEC and Canalyst, adding a super fast way to access SEC filings and earning calls via BAM SEC and offering access to more than 4,000 fully drivable financial models with Canalyst. Tegas is well on their way to building a full suite of research products that can displace the le legacy terminal providers like CapIQ and FactSet. And I'd encourage you to check them out if you haven't recently. They are moving incredibly quickly with many new features and data sets. As a bonus note, Blog readers will know that I run a monthly, uh, well, actually bi-monthly deep dive series sponsored by Tegas. In them, I go deep into industries and companies with fascinating questions using Tegas expert calls. I'd encourage you to check that out if you're interested in seeing how expert interviews can help you learn more about a company and industry. All right, hello, welcome to the Yet Another Value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. If you like this podcast, it'd mean a lot if you could rate, review, subscribe, follow it wherever you're watching or listening to it. With me today, I'm happy to have on for the third time, my friend, Bill Chen. Bill is the managing partner at a institutional real estate fund. Bill, how's it going? I'm doing, I'm doing great. How are you, Andrew? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And we're going to see each other in person next week. So I'm looking, really looking forward to that. But uh, let, me, let me start this podcast the way I do every podcast. First, a disclaimer to remind everyone that Nothing on this podcast is investing advice. We'll, we'll probably be talking about a tender offer associated with the company here. So everybody should just particularly keep in mind, not investing advice related to the tender offer, not investing advice. We're not financial advisors. Please do your own work. Second, a pitch for you, my guest. Again, this is the third time you're on the podcast. So people can go listen to the first two for the full pitch. But uh, I consider you a good investor and a good friend. I think people are once again going to see the degree of due diligence and work you do on the names. I we were just going through all the properties that the company owns. And I was like, hey, have you been here? Have you been here? And you're like, yes, I'm a boots on the ground investor. I've been to Hawaii, Vegas, Houston to see all of these things. So you do great work on these things. I think that's going to shine through here. And I have recently learned you have absolutely impeccable taste in Chinese food. So I can vouch for that as well. But <laughs> all that out the way, the company we're going to talk about is Howard Hughes. The ticker here is HHC. Every value investor, I think, at least knows it. It has probably been burnt once by it. But there's a lot going on with HHC here. I, I think we want to talk about the value of HHC. There's a tender offer from Bill Ackman that will actually expire next Thursday or Friday. I can't remember the exact day. I, I know that's in play. So I'll just turn it over to you. HHC, do you want to start talking about the company? Do you want to talk about the tender? Where do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think just like briefly um... – what I want to like touch upon is uh, again, like reiterate, this is not a best advice. This is, you know, just what, what my purpose is to offer a framework and evidence to support that. Why not tendering your shares into this Dutch auction is a good idea. Like all, all we're here to do, these are my personal opinions, not investment advice, but I think, I think, you know, I will present pretty good evidence today. And also just, you know, framework, the Dutch tender offer is, uh, uh, in, in a range between fifty-two fifty to sixty dollars. So the stock, as of right now, trades at sixty dollars and forty-six cents. So this is the market saying that you know, if they wanted to, they could just sell into the market today at a range that is higher on the very top range of the tender offer. So, so just you know, I, I think that's a good framework to kind of think about. And also, um, I just also want to reiterate. Uh, I'm a very long-term oriented investor, you know, on my previous po uh, podcast with Andrew, with FRP and Clipper, like, you know, I let management team run their, the business that they want to. But in this case, I'm just a little bit critical of Ackman trying to, you know, gain de facto control of the company. And my purpose today is to kind of give people a framework to think about how much is Howard Hughes worth with growth potential, right? And um, you know, what are the evidence backing up the claims that I'm going to lay out, right? And, and uh, you know, we've actually published a public model in Excel. Anybody could go and, you know, download it, right? We'll, we'll provide a link. And, I'll put a uh, link in the show notes for anyone. Yep. Awesome. And, and we could, you, you, you could, you know, play around with, you could test drive it. You could change the cap rate assumptions. You, you could, you could take, change the percentage impairment. So, so it's something that, that, you know, the public has access to and, and you could, 
you could, you know, sensitize and test drive and, 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 and impair our assumptions. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, uh, with, 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 with that out of the way. I think a good way to think about big picture is the current price is $60. Uh, we have put out a model and, and we have an average of $110 per share. Now, this is including some really key assumptions like we're taking massive impairments on, on, on assets like the recently acquired Douglas Ranch. We impair that by 50%. The seaport, we impair that by 40%. We're using DCFs of 12 to 15%. Uh, and, and, you know, the management team has come out with, DC, uh, you know, discount rates that are, that are, you know, in the high single digit, digits, like, you know, they, 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 they've guided land, land price appreciation that are 47%, we're using 2%. So, so we're, we're really just scaling back the assumptions and we're still getting to a number that is, you know, 110 versus something that trades at $60 today. And, and another way, you know, another real important aspect, which I'll get into is that there is, this is a buy something that's at a discount, but there's a tremendous amount of hidden growth. There's a tremendous amount of hidden growth, which we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, there, is, there is a hidden growth engine here where you could reinvest capital at 25% return. You know, like, you know, that's what the company officially said today, cash and cash 25%. We've gone back, you know, into the analysis independently, like verify a lot of the building level development returns and we have seen you know returns as low as uh you know the low on the low end is is, is low teens but you know we've seen irs as high as 40 50 percent on some of the really really successful projects all right bill if i can just jump in and yeah. you can confirm or deny but i think the reason that's important is a lot of value investors know stocks that the nav is 100 and the stock trades for 50 right and the issue with a lot of these things is it's not great businesses. There's not a lot, you know, it's the classic, oh, okay, there's a bunch of cash over there. But if you get it tomorrow, awesome, you're going to make a double. If you get it in 10 years, cool, you made a double over 10 years. That's not a great IRR. I think what's important here is you're saying, hey, my very conservative NAV is a double from the current stock price. But what's important here, and this will come into play later, if you don't get the 120 tomorrow, that's okay because they've got all these projects that have great return possibilities associated with them so that the NAV five years from now is going to be 180 instead of 120. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, no, I think that's, that's, that's just really why that's important. That's, that's, that's exactly correct. And, and I think that, and this is something that we pay a lot of attention to you and, and, and on a unit level basis, we will go in and we will track, okay, they took a four acre parcel, built a multifamily on it and spent a hundred million dollars. You know, I'm just doing a hypothetical example, right? Spent a hundred million dollars on it. They built it to an 8% cap rate and the market used to be 4%. Now we're using 5% cap rate assumption, but like, you know, and if you build multifamily to an 8% cap rate when market was 4%, you essentially double the value on an unlevered basis, right? Now, if you use some construction loan, the, the the equity the equity return on equity could sometimes be anywhere from like four to five x depending on what that what that equity capitalization is right so so those the, that that's really really unique and the company has twenty to thirty years of pipeline of these commercial development projects right and that's probably the what's more exciting because and we all been there but we all like first start out we buy companies that are you know, deep discounts, the net nets, the the textile mills, right? This is not, you know, this is not the original Berkshire business. This this is probably one of the best real estate businesses that that I've come across. So so you know, let's let's kind of dig into it. Like let's go into the, let's go break down that nav. And what I would do is I'll go with easy to understand to to more complexity. And I think that's like the easier way to do. So so again, there's a there's a public model out there, and what we, the, the the way we will break down the model is there's operating assets and 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 of 4.2 billion dollars. These are stabilized assets, you know, based on Q2 annualized net operating income, uh, 4.2 billion dollars, and it, it's a mix of office, retail, and multifamily. We use a 7% cap rate for office, 6% cap rate for retail, 5% cap rate for multifamily. And, and this is, you know, frankly, a year ago, 
those multifamily would have traded at three and a half percent cap rate. But interest rates have moved. You know, things are different today. And I think that five percent cap rate is appropriate for multifamily because these are in, you know, they're all they're in their own MPC where they control all the supply. So so this this applies, you know, some people have given me pushback and say those cap rates are too low. What's different is that they're all located within their own MPC where they have this unique NIMBY, you know, NIMBY for you, YIMBY for me, where they, how Hughes could build anything they want, but no one else could really build anything. And, and, and when, it, when, it, when you constrain that to a zip code, they have these really, really strong dynamics uh, where any new supply essentially is going to come from Howard Hughes. And they have incredible large concentration of supply in their hands. So that's why those seven, six, and five, I think, are appropriate. And also keep in mind, none of these assets are older than 10 years. A lot of them were actually built within the last five years. So there's an age element. There's a quality element. There's, there's a strategic location where they, they have a ton of control within their MPCs. So this is, I call this portion the slap a cap rate, right? You know, take an NOI, slap a cap rate on it, and you can sensitize it. It's very easy to figure out. You can sense. Let me just ask real quickly yeah. on this because this is a it's a weird one where I don't disagree. Like the offices in uh, the office buildings that they have at a seven percent this cap rate, I don't disagree with that number, right? And that's one point six of the four point two billion dollars in your model. But I, I like the pushback I had when I was looking at it. It's like, yeah, I don't disagree. But if I looked at publicly traded office buildings, you know, and not just SLG and Vernado, which are almost exclusively New York, but I mean, people who are across the country, BXP is one, there's a few others. I can't really find one that trades on the public markets that's going for under a 10% cap rate, or, or I guess it's over, right? 10% is the minimum. Most of them are kind of in the 11 to 13% okay. range. Yep. So I, I, I get this weird mix where I'm like, okay, I don't disagree with Bill, but at the same yeah. time, like both on an opportunity cost basis and where the market's trading. And look, these guys, it's not just these guys. LSG has been saying for a year, hey, uh, are the stock market values is at a 9% cap rate and we're selling New York built, New York office buildings all the time at a 4% cap rate. That doesn't make any sense. But I guess my pushback would just be, okay, I could just go buy BXP for an 11% cap rate. Why, why, why not do that? Does that make so, sense? So no, that I, I think that's a great example. Uh, you know, great pushback. And, and my response to that would be all these other companies that you mentioned do not have this ecosystem control, right? So, so that's important. The, the, the second part is that in any kind of uh, zip code, right? Any kind of community, any kind of town, there's, there's a proper mix of office, retail, and multifamily, right? None of these other companies that you mentioned could just say, oh, you know, office is oversupply. Like, like we have this commercial acre. You know what? Like, we could just build multifamily and retail and like healthcare, right? So you could change. It's adaptive. You could change the mix. And and what happens when you build more multifamily in that area is that is that now now you got more residents that w creates demand for the office. And this is what's really unique about their communities, right? Is that you still, there's still a great amount of resi land and great amount of commercial land where they could shift that mix. They could build, the, build the, the supply in response to where the demand is. And over time, that mix shifts from that office over to, to, to uh, you know, to more to, towards, you know, multifamily retail. And also, you know, they, they started doing healthcare as well, right? So, so I think I think that's a very very unique distinction. Now, if you're Vornado and you are you know SL Green, you are a certain percentage in a 300 million square foot you know New York City, and you have no option to shift that mix over to multifamily. You 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 you're, you're like confined to the growth rate like, like of Manhattan, right? Which is you know like that's kind of confined as opposed to like in their MPCs. What's very, very different is that, like, like what you got to keep in mind is that in most of their MPCs in Summerland and in and, and, uh, Bridgeland, uh, you literally have, they're literally adding 2,000 residents a year in the AJ, in, in like the AJ, like, like with, within like a half mile to mile radius area. Like you, you have this huge increase in population. So, so I think that's what makes it a little bit unique. 
Also, I kind of have a personal opinion that like the public office REITs are are probably undervalued. But you know, the mark, the you know, so 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 this I think this is this is me kind of saying that the cap rates for some of these high quality SL Green and Bornado is probably not correct. Like if you look at the private transaction, that's not what they are. But what's unique here is that they could really scale back. Like when they do build office, it's often built to suit with like a 10, 15 year, you know, lease on it. Sorry, I, I was I was agreeing with you and I was also looking at the models. No, the, the only the only other thing I would say is you said at the end, SLG and Bernardo, they're multiple. And I think this would apply to all the office buildings. A lot of the public trade real estate is not correct. And like, it's just, it's tough because I, I, again, I do not disagree. I know a friend who, I don't know if you know Park Hotels, he's done a, a lot on that. That's the spinoff from Hilton. And if you, if you did what Bill does and you go to each of the individual hotels that Park did, like the boots on the ground and you looked, you'd be like, oh, there's absolutely no way precedent comps and it, there's absolutely no way parks price is right, but it becomes one of those like, Oh, unless you're ever going to realize the value for it, it's always going to trade underneath it. So it, it's this weird, like, when does the catalyst come? And then it's like, Hey, if everything else is trading at a discount to park and you see something else, uh, a discount and you see something else trading at a discount, like the opportunity cost versus investing all these, it's just a, a little weird chicken or the egg dynamic. Did you want to say anything else on the, uh, did you want to say anything else on the operating, the stabilized operating assets or should we move no, to no, a different I don't, I don't, I don't think there's really anything. I mean, I think, I think, and, and, and again, like we, like there's a model that's available, like if you want to shift that to eight or 9% cap rate for the office, like, like if, brings down the nav but like you know i think i don't think like it breaks the the I, the, the thesis that's what i was doing as you were speaking i was looking at the model and you know if i change the cap rate on just the office from seven to ten which i don't think anybody thinks like good no. stabilized the office towers yeah. and pretty good metros are going for 10 yeah it takes 500 million off the value but it it, it doesn't break it certainly yeah, exactly. doesn't break the it doesn't, thesis it doesn't, it doesn't break the thesis yeah. Cool. Okay. So that's yeah. the operating assets, which I'm with you. Those are the easiest, right? Like they're already yeah. producing cash flow. There is a little bit more for them to stabilize to get to, but these are good buildings. They're producing cash flow. It's generally you take yeah. off the calculator, you say, here's the cash flow, you divide by a number to get the, yeah. to get, and that's it. So uh, what do you want to talk about next? Well, I mean, I think the next category is the unstabilized and under construction. You know, there's 650 million dollars of value there, and what what it what that category is is just a collection of assets where. Uh, it's a mix of all different product types, but, um, you know, and we just use one time book value to 1.3. So if you think about, when you think about their development, uh, you know, again, going back to that 25% cash and cash return that, that, that the C CFO just set on the earnings call today, right? Like as they take that, the, that, that, you know, asset through construction and get it built and get it, you know, 40, 50% lease that value should be higher than, you know, the capital that they put into to, to the project less the debt, right? I mean, because they have a historical you know, um, track record of creating value there. So, uh, you know, I think, I think we, the, the 1.3 time book value is only for the multifamily and then everything else is like one to 1.1. So you could also, people could also mess around with that, with that number, you know, if you want to adjust it all the way down to one, like, you know, it 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 doesn't break the model, and, and that's six hundred million of value, which six hundred million is a lot of it's a lot of money. But you know, when you're when your model's putting out twelve billion, and you're saying, hey, we're basically valuing six hundred million of st at cost ish, like it doesn't break the. Even if you were like, these guys wasted a bunch of money on these projects, haircutted by twenty percent, like I. I doesn't really move the model yeah, there. So yeah. Yep. Yep, okay. So yep. we've gone through the operating asset, the stabilized operating assets. We've gone through the unstabilized. I, I think the next one, if I'm just going down the list is, do you want to talk Seaport next? No, let's say Seaport. We're going to go the, easiest to understand to more, more complex over time. Seaport right? is the most controversial, but I'm with you. Yeah. There's, there's more, there's more important things to talk about, yeah. more valuable things to talk about. I guess MPC is the next, or where no, no, do we'll, do, we'll do we'll do War Village because okay. I think I War think that's Village. Easier. Yeah. So so what War these, Village is? What oh, War I, Village? I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, I was just saying, these matter, right? These are yeah. uh, the Hawaii. They're yep. the condos. One point one, one point two billion dollars of value in your thing. So that's about ten percent of the gross asset value here. And me rambling out the way now. It's on over to you. So so 
what is this? They they own a six, 60 acre site, like right on the water in Honolulu, in an area called War Village, right? So think like like tall, glassy, high end, like you know, waterfront towers in in Honolulu, Hawaii, that they sell for fourteen hundred dollars a square foot, right? It's basically like Manhattan prices. And what's really unique is that the buyers in Honolulu will put. 20% hard deposit means that they put that deposit down. They can't, if they walk away from it, they forfeit 20% down payment, right? And these towers are pre-sold. So, so they, they still have the right to build, I believe, eight or nine towers in total, right? And, and um, they are, there's four out of those eight or nine remaining are 90% pre-sold. So like, 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 we, 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 this is not a speculative development business. This this is basically a manufacturing business where P, you, the customer has given you a hard, you know, a hard non-refundable deposit you can't walk away from. And and you know, on the Q2 earnings call today, they just closed. You know, they, I, I believe they just got about two hundred million dollars of cash proceeds like, from my closing closing out two third of the units in a tower that they they you know they just closed. So. So this is a part where if you look into the supplemental and you look at, you know, like the, the four towers that are under contract, right, that are, that are like, you know, um, that are, I mean, so there's two of them that they're building right now. And then there's two that are, they haven't put a shovel in the ground, but all four of them are over 90% pre-sold with 20% hard deposits, you know, collected from, from, from buyers. And then there's four more remaining that you know they haven't pre-sold yet right so so this is an area where we're using an 11 percent discount rate right to discount all the future cash flow um we're assuming a 30 percent you know profit margin and and also like a tax rate but the the key to understand is that half of all the future condo sales are 90 percent pre-sold with 20 percent you know hard deposits that they can't walk away from so, 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 you know, there's a certain like bird in hen element in here and, and people, I don't think like people need to like get into the weed as much, just like understand that dynamic, understand this is not a speculative development. This is not like, you know, you build the condo tower. Now you got to go market it. And then you're subject to the whims of like mortgage rates and whatnot. And, and, and I think like something like, if I remember correctly, 50% of buyers are basically cash. Only 50% of buyers actually require some sort of mortgage. Like the, the buyers who buy these assets uh, are, are the kind that don't need, like they're, they're not subject to the mortgage market. So who, because, you know, when I was prepping for this podcast, I meant to say this earlier, but I, yeah. I remember like every time I look at HHC and I've looked at it a lot, I'm always like, oh, I'm just going to look at a simple operating company, a simple real estate company. And then I'm looking yeah. like, oh, three different MPCs, Hawaii condos. And I think the Hawaii condos are actually, it, it's the MPCs require more assumptions, but I think the Hawaii condo business is actually a little harder to wrap your head around just because like they're pre-selling and, and all this sort of stuff. And it just, it doesn't mesh with the way as a non-real estate person, I kind of think about real estates or I, I think a, a condo in New York, right? They go build it. And then a month, a year before it's open, they're desperately trying to sell the units. And no, stuff. no, so, so no, this, this is a good point. So like, like the best example is Vornado actually developed a condo tower called, I, I believe 220 park, right? Like no, no that's when it, it was like one of those, you know, billionaire row towers. And in 2020, people were like, are, are they actually going to close on this? And they like these are like forty, fifty million dollar condo units, right? And they close every single one of them were closed because people put a a like a twenty or thirty percent hard deposit on it five years ago. Yep. And and in twenty twenty, they they all closed. And and I think that those towers sold out for like two two billion dollars, if I remember correctly. So that is the right model. This this is like not a traditional speculative like. We're gonna go build it. And we're gonna sweat bullets and see see if we could sell it, right? Like, there's another couple of Holy Trinity company called Trinity Place Holdings, right? Which is the old Sims building. Right? Oh, I know Trinity right. Place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like that's a polar opposite, right? They built everything and then they went to market, and they're like having a really hard time moving the units, right? So, so this is a totally different business model. This is this is a manufacturing business. It, it's almost like you're, you're, you're almost manufacturing widgets at this point, And people are saying, take my 20% deposit, 
and 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 we can't walk away from it. 220 Park is also uh, that I thought so, and I just looked it up. That's where Ken Griffin bought the most expensive home ever 200, 238 million condo in 220. But let, let me ask about what. Yes. So these are people, I mean, you're going and you're putting up the money. I mean, it's five or six years before the condo is actually going to get delivered. It's a giant, beautiful condo, condo in Hawaii. Who's, who's the typical buyer for this type of, uh, this type of condo? So um, if I remember correctly, a lot of it are actually kind of west coast tech executives because like if you're if you're californian and and washington like you're very wealthy you really you could you could access hawaii a lot easier in the east coast there's a big japanese buyer uh presence there and then there's uh i think only 20 percent is actually local for for like the uh uh so, so 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 a lot of that buyer base is you know not sensitive to to mortgage rates and just, I, I thought it might be a lot of Japanese buyers and just have those, I've looked at some, a, a lot of the timeshare companies have a lot of business in Hawaii mm -hmm. and they'll say, look, 20% plus of our customers come from Japan. And that has been a disaster post COVID because obviously COVID hits travel, but then Japan has really, really strict travel policies. I think that's starting to come back, but have they been able to sell kind of for the past couple of years with the COVID restrictions, you know, it may be a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, they it, haven't had be, any trouble. No, no exactly. And, and and that's, that's even with like a new tower, like, I guess like a fifth tower that taken out to market, like, like just the pre-selling in this quarter was like 40%, right? Like, yep. it, it's just like, I'm just not seeing any evidence of slowdown. Like, like I thought earlier this year, um, that that the, the the velocity will slow down and and it didn't right like it, it's just like if there's one thing that's consistently surprised me is the strength of the hawaii condo market and then i guess just to build on so look a lot the the stuff that's done that's all sold pre-sold like that, that'll be getting done the future about obviously you think i'm again i'm cheating off your model 400 million of value is coming from the under construction about 800 million is coming from the future construction yeah the good news there is the future construction it's not, as you said, it's not on spec, right? If, if for some reason the buyers aren't coming in or something, they can pause or they can shut this project down. You're not going to burn. Oh, they don't, they don't, they don't put a shovel in the ground yeah. unless like, I, I, I think their rationale is they don't put a shovel in the ground unless it's 80% pre-sold. Like, so people, people you, you get the pre-sale up to like 60% and then they can't get to 80, like they, they won't build it. And, and then it's 30% margins, right? So once you're at 80% pre-sold with 30% margins, You've covered your whole cost yep, basis, yep, so then yep, you can go yep. sell the rest of the cut. I'd love yep. to get one of those condos for cheap, but okay, cool. Yeah, Anything yeah. else? And, and then also, about? just to clarify, like, yeah. like, like, you see that four seventeen, right? That four seventeen number, I think, I think there's about two two hundred million dollars that, that that's actually like, like, you know, in the Q three, like that's like in the pocket now. The cash this, is, this is based off Q two, right? And then and that, out of out of that seven eighty three, it's really six towers, if I remember correctly, and there's two of it that's pre-sold yeah so like, like when you look at that 417 plus 783 in the model like you, the way to really think about it is that the 417 is under construction today out of that 783 call it like a third of it is 90 percent pre-sold so so like it's not like that 783 is still to be pre-sold like like there's there's a there's a really big chunk of, like, like there's probably more than half of the net present value that's like already pre-sold yep yeah. cash and bait. anything else we should be talking about with ward no i mean i think i think like that's that's i, I, I mean it's just i've been out there in person uh it's land constraint you got the ocean on one one side you got the mountain in the back there's like nowhere to go it's chronically under supply people love it uh you know qualitatively like it, it there's it just just like just look at the pre-sale numbers look at the pre-sale numbers and and look at the historical margins and um, uh, and also just like from a a risk perspective, you know, people complain that they got too much leverage, right? They got too much leverage. But like, if you think about from the perspective of of just selling out the next four towers, will probably get them about se you know seven eight you know seven hundred to nine hundred million dollars of cash inflow. And so we've now talked about operating assets, unstabilized assets, and the Ward Village assets. Yeah. That's on your numbers, about $6 billion of value. So yeah. we've now covered basically all of the liabilities. And look, a lot of the liabilities are 
secured mortgages that are at the asset level. And we haven't even talked about the asset that these are covering, yeah. but so it's a little bit funky math, but at this point we've covered all the, uh, we've covered all liability value. So now we're just kind of getting to equity value. I guess next place to go, it's either other assets or the MPCs, which would you I like think to? other assets is that will be easier to cover because if you look at the other assets in essence, it's all, a lot of it's cash. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, so, so it's easy to understand, right? A lot of it is, is, is cash and restricted cash. A lot of it is kind of prepaid expenses, you know, in this business, you know, whether it's construction, so it's sort of like there's all these prepaid expenses. And then there's about a half a billion dollars worth of municipal, like what is called MUDs and SIDS. So yep. in, in Nevada and Texas, when they built the, the, the lots for sale, when they put in the infrastructure, the government will actually reimburse them, right? So you could think of that as half a billion dollars of muni bond, right? Like in that sense, that's what it is, right? So that amounts to $1.9 billion. And also like, keep in mind, like they own some like cats and dog assets. Like they, they still have more air rights in New York City, New York Seaport, right? Like a lot of people like, like, we're saying that's worth zero. They have like air rights above the fashion show air mall in like in Vegas, right on the strip, right? Like, like we're saying that's zero. Like there's some land in Maui. Like we're saying that's zero. So, yep. so there's $1.9 billion that's mostly prepaid expenses, cash, and essentially muni, muni bond, right? I, so, I'm glad you hit the, the muds because that's the one thing I, I think people see and be like, oh, what's that? It's like, that, it's pretty much money good. That's, the government basically saying, hey, if you build here and you get a, a, a whole MPC, that's going to be a massive tax base. Like we would love to supplement that to get the tax base going and get that kind of going up, yep, which yep. I think brings us nicely into let's talk about the MPCs. These yeah, are let's, let's, the majority of the value of the company. This yeah. is what when Ackman goes and he pitches HHC at, you know, what at a Stone conference or whatever. The first thing he always says is, look, if you the way to get rich is if you have an MPC and you yeah. hold it for 50 years and you develop it properly, you're going to get really rich. He's given yeah. the, I think it's Irving out in California. He's given Irvine. The, yeah. Irvine this company. is what he loves. This is the, the key asset to, uh, to HSC. So I'll flip it over to you. Sure. Sure. So, so, so there's a residential component and there's a commercial component. And, and I think like, you know, we could use the word MPC and, and sometimes like you, you kind of get caught up in the semantic, like MPC stands for master plan communities, right? Like for those people who are new to your story, like just want to explain to that. Like, like what is it exactly? I, I mean, the, a good way to think about it is that like any town that you live in, let's say like there's a town that you live in that's like a hundred thousand residents, right? Like how did it start, right? Like how did that town, how did that like small city start uh, eventually? I mean, at some point, was probably all potato like potato farms or just like a patch of dirt right like 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 literally like that's that's what it is right and i think anyone even without a real estate background understands some like some some basic principles about that where where if you like an mpc that has 10,000 residents you're going to sell the land for on a per acre basis you're going to sell the land for a lot less then when you got 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, you know, like, like when you get to 90,000 residents and you only have land for that remaining 10,000, you're going to sell that land for a really, really high price, right? And on the commercial side, this kind of same dynamic, like, like think about every town, every city has like a downtown area, has like some sort of like dense commercial hub, right? And, and like, like, you could have a few hundred acres in like a central location and, and it, it's not going to be worth a lot in the beginning when you only have five or 10,000 residents, but as more residents move in, those parcels go up in value tremendously. Right. So, so that's what these two, uh, that, that, that's what these two assets are, right. The MPC residential, you know, represents, uh, the residential lot that they own in um, in Las Vegas, right? In Summerlin, Las Vegas, in uh, Bridgeland, which is, you know, outside of the, you know, um, uh, it's a little northwest of Houston. And uh, there's a little area called Woodland Hills, it's, which is like further up north. And they just bought a place in Arizona called Douglas Ranch, right? Which is probably the, the, the earliest, like in early stages. Um, and am I missing any? Hold on, give me a second. Uh, I haven't seen residential. Uh, so you the got Bridgeland, Summerlin. 
What's that? The remains of the Maryland asset? Am I thinking about uh, that? No, the Maryland is purely commercial. Okay. Maryland's so so it's it's mostly Bridgeland, Summerland, and Douglas Ranch. Now, me being the boots on the on the ground guy, I've been out there and I've seen all of them, right? I've seen I've seen all these assets. The only thing I haven't seen is a new acquisition in in Arizona uh, in Arizona. So yeah. what what I've done now, what I've done is is that like like we basically said that higher interest rates, you know, home building is gonna uh, slow. We've taken the average land sale price, cut it by 20%, and taken down future land price growth to 2% from like the company guided to 4 to 7%. Company guided to, you know, discount rates that are, you know, 7 to 9%, and we're using 12 to 15, right? Now, I, I want to I like differentiate this from like, like, you know, there's another company called Four Star, right? What they do is they like buy raw land, they put the infrastructure in there, they sell it to home builders, right? Yep. And and those are typically three year kind of like life cycles, right? That that's that's not what this business is because what Four Star is, they turn raw patch of uh, you know dirt into finished lots for home builders to buy, right? Um, but they don't invest in in retail. They don't invest in offices. They don't invest in medical. They don't invest in any multifamily. They don't build communities. They don't do placemaking, right? Placemaking is, is really like, like if you think about what Howard Hughes is in the business of doing, they're in the business of putting in different pieces to a town so that it makes it attractive for people to live there, right? And what that does is that, and you see it in the numbers, you see year after year, the residential land prices go up. Like if you yep. look at the historical, it you know they've been able to hit you know in that five to seven percent. And there are some years where you see these dramatic increases in land price, right? It's and, and it's exactly what you said, right? The first homes when you're selling it, there's no one around, there's no infrastructure. It, it, people are taking a chance, they're betting. You're you're going out and promising them, hey, I'm going to build this yep. infrastructure. I'm going to, and, but they're going to get a discount. But guess what? The second round of homes, they say, oh, there's. 200 homes around here. There's a store, there's a grocery center. The third round of homes, oh, there's a thousand stores. There's a Whole Foods. There's a movie yeah. theater. By the last round of homes, it's like, oh my God, these are the last homes in the area. Yeah. It's all built up. There's all this experiential stuff. The schools are out there. We've got the best schools. Like yep. everything's brand new. Like the more you do, the more developed it gets. It, it's a little bit, it reminds me of nobody likes malls anymore, but it's a mall, right? It's a network effect. The first stores get yep. the cheapest deal. By the last stores, when it's 95% leased up, everyone's to be there because that's where all the traffic, that's where all the everything is. Yep, yeah. I mean, literally, they're building cities and cities have network effects, right? Yep. So, so and, 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 and I think that uh, this is where, like, 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 where I think, uh, the, 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 there's there are issues with gap accounting when it comes to real estate, right? Like when you sell these parcels and you add a nice retail, like a nice retail strip mall or like a nice experiential place uh, in a community, the gap accounting does not take into account the fact that like now your residential land has appreciated. But yep. like you see that in the land price appreciation when they sell the land, right? So you do see that, but like. Like the, from a NAB perspective, the book value still stays the same, but the book value has actually gone up. And 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 another thing is like, keep in mind, like like these these parcels don't sell out in three years. There is like a thirty year inventory, and and like another dynamic is they usually will have ten to fifteen builders in in the in these communities. So so it's not like they're begging builders to come build. Like the builders are all fighting for these land parcels. I actually had a conversation with the CEO of uh, Green Brick Partners, which is a very custom home builder. And he says, he says, as a builder, he goes, Howard Hughes is the last company I want to deal with because they, they have all the control, like the way, like they make the builders compete for, like, like, yes, they have the best land, but like, that's not our business because from a builder perspective, like Howard Hughes has all the control, all the power. Yep. Yep. So- we, so NPCs, I, I guess we mainly focus on the residential side, though I think the same dynamics apply to the commercial side. This is four billion dollars of value uh, out of the you know the gross asset value. I think you've got here is about twelve billion. So this is really uh, the big swing here. Every everything matters, right? But this is the big swing. Anything else we should be talking about just on the assumptions or how people should be thinking about these NPCs? So, 
so yeah, so on the commercial side, I, I want to get to the commercial side, right? Because on the residential side, we have a $1.6 billion figure, and that's that's a DCF, right? And it's like, how do we, the commercial side is the only side where we've like come out and said that the, the management team has guided to a, I believe, like a $2 billion number, and we're willing to stick our neck out and say, no, no, that's worth 2.4, right? That's, that's worth, we're like, we're 20% above what management team has, uh, has said to us. And it's like, why are we willing, why are we so like gone home saying that this MPC commercial portion, and, and the reason is because like, if you look at the model, what winds up happening is that every analyst, uh, like if you look at the JP Morgan model, what they do is they say, oh, like you historically sold land at anywhere from half a million to a million dollars an acre on the commercial side, right? And let me comp that. I'm going to apply a tax rate on it, right? And I am going to like do a DCF on it, right? And that's totally flawed, right? Totally flawed. And the reason why it's flawed is that the company strategically will sell these commercial land to a, uh, to, to like a fire station police department. So they're, they're essentially like kind of giving that land away and, and cause you need those public, you know, facilities yep. in your community. Right. And then the remaining land, what they're doing is that, especially those that are like closer to, to uh, the town center area, they will put an office, they'll put retail, they'll put, well, you know, multifamily. And that's where that 25% on lever cash and cash come from. Yep. And, and, and I like being the person that I am, I've been to the woodlands. I've been to downtown Columbia. I've been out to Summerlin. I spent most, at least two trips in every single one of these. And I can tell you that the remaining parcel that they have, there's, there's 200 acres in, in Summerlin. There's 200 acres in, in Woodland minimal. And there's 96 acres in Columbia. Those are worth a lease, you know, a lease, um, uh, $2 million each. Right. So that in itself, is about a billion dollars of value. And then the remaining portion, you know, we value those at quote like 360 to 727 for the remaining parcels, right? And that is a key differentiator on like why our model is different than like every everyone else's, you know, JP Morgan, et cetera, et cetera. And and I I've, I've asked the management team, I'm like, why don't you guys stress this? And and they're like, you know, people don't believe us already. Like we came out and told them like, this commercial acre is so valuable. Like they, they, they like won't believe. And I'm like, this is where you, every single year, they could probably put a half a billion dollars. And this is, this is on a on lever basis. They could probably put a half a billion dollars of capital into the ground. Right. And, and like the lever portion will be a fraction of that, maybe, maybe 20, 30% of that. And, and that, that like, you know, that, that equity portion will earn, you know, 25% is what they've done historically, right? Yep. So, so this is a key driver, the, the growth engine. And, and, you know, from like, I've looked at the IRs, like, I don't think, I think the worst projects are low teams. Like I, we've seen IRs as high as, you know, 40%. And, and this is the portion where like, we're kind of pounding the table and saying like, yes, like you're buying something at half of NAV, but this is the part where if you if you have to sit there and wait, like they could just keep putting, you know, and 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 another thing, another thing I want to mention is that downtown Columbia, I went to downtown Columbia, I think four years ago. It hasn't hit like critical mass. You're like not sure if it's gonna be successful. The thing is that like as you add more office and as you add more multifamily, now it's denser. Now your risk of it not working out has yep. gone down dramatically, right? Like we, we just, you know, my, my interns and I just did analysis on, on, on 20 acres, on 20 acres in downtown Columbia. They built two multifamily, an office, a restaurant, ice skating rink, and, uh, and they still got land left over. And, and I think in, in, in that sense, once they develop it, like each acre of land is worth uh, somewhere like seven or $8 million. So, so you like, you, 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 you take, land that everyone think is worth a million dollars an acre once you develop it, it's worth you know seven eight million dollars like like the rule of thumb is you probably take the end state and divide it by three to get to like an imputed pre-development value so yep. like if it's worth eight million dollars like divided by three that that's you know actually closer to three million dollars we're using two right and they have kind of five four hundred ninety six acres that are core and the remaining are less valuable because it you know, a little bit further away from, 
from the town centers, but you know, this is the part where 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 they could create, you know, a ton of growth from. This is you hold the MPC and you get rich over 40 years. So at this point, because I do want to, I I've been very bullish because look, I, I think anybody who looks at this sees what Ackman sees it, when they look at this, right? You, you see the MPC, you see that, you see the value. So I've been pretty bullish. We've been pretty bullish. We've almost covered all the value, and I do want to get to my pushbacks. But let's cover the last two pieces of values yeah. here, right? The first would be the last piece of value would be Seaport, which I think is the most controversial project. Okay, yep. And then the second piece would be the capitalized GNA expenses. We can get there in a second, but Seaport, I'll just sum it up. Seaport is uh, downtown Manhattan. This yep. was their trophy pro- property for a long time. I think it's fair to say it's been bungled. And it's the first thing that everybody talks about when they, they talk about Seaport and uh, when they talk about HHC. And at this point, you know, to me, they've put a billion dollars of value into it. We've already covered $12 billion of value here, which more which covers all the liabilities, the stock price, and then some. I don't think Seaport matters that much at this point. I think it's going to be a lot more successful than the Bears think, just based on kind of expectations. But I'm rambling a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll toss it over yeah, to you. So, so I'll, I think a little bit of context is like important, right? Like one, I think it's, it's, it's hard to develop in new york city like like when we when we did the clipper podcast i'm like i'm like you want to own new york city assets because it's so darn <laughs> hard right it's so darn them. hard to develop yep. here right and and also like I, I think some context is important because like everyone's like these guys are idiots the management team's an idiot look at the albatross that is the seaport right i think some context is important because like if you follow what's happened to retail rent in new york city new york city uh high street retail like all the major quarters, like uh, Times Square, like, you know, Harrow Square, like uh, um, Soho, et cetera. Retail rent across the board in New York City is down 40, 50% since 2016. When, yep. they, when they like, you know, like, like it wasn't that long ago before that. And I would actually say the, the management team uh, and also like, oh, let's throw COVID in here as well, right? Like they, they were like gaining traction and then COVID happened and like the movie theater went out of business, right? Like it's it, it just like, this is meant to be a restaurant entertainment experiential place, right? And so for two have, years, they lost everything. They have, they, they lost everything and, and they have to like re basically like redevelop, re-tenant the space, right? Like, like let's put some historical, like let's put some context. It's like, are there, are there factors that were out of their control? Like, like, was it in their control that retail rent will go down 40, 50% in New York City, right? Like, like that's just that's just what happened to retail in New York City, right? Uh, is it in their control that COVID happened? No, like, like those is two it in things- in control that New York City lost international tourists for two years at this point? Yeah. Like, no. Yeah. Now, now, what was in their control was that the previous management team, like there was one concept in there called 10 Corsa Como, I think it was like, too high end for the area right because i think he, he was like i think he had a vision that was like a little bit out of touch with the neighborhood right that was in their control and and that is a fault of theirs right now what's uh also like there are some office space in there like and like as we know office is tough in new york city right um so so it it's like why is a seaport important it's that people absolutely hate it they have zero expectation i actually I'm there all the time. I, I spent way too much money there. I take my kids there. We love it, right? And and why is it important? I think it's important because if it works, right? If the seaport work, that like half a billion dollar figure, because like like I kid you not, like that could swing to like almost two billion dollars of value. And, and it's like, how do you get there? So like in New York City, you have all these places like. Rockefeller Center, Times Square, and and you know, like Seaport could kind of emerge as one of those areas where where like those are trophy assets where if you were to sell that, like there's there's probably some family who will want to own the Seaport or the Rockefeller Center, right? So so I think that's what's important. Another thing to consider is that the Seaport literally gets sponsors that pay them seven figure sponsor fees, right? It's like there's there's a Heineken, I think, pays them a million dollars just in sponsors, right? Like, there's like no cost. It's, it's basically all forced to buy which like makes you think like like if the seaport was such a horrible place, why are they? Why are sponsors 
paying Howard Hughes what seven figures just to put their name up. I, I told you my buddy proposed the other day and uh, he sent me, I was looking at the pictures. So I was like, where'd you press it? Oh, he proposed at Seaport uh, on one of the piers or something because it's a beautiful spot, right? Like I, yeah. I do think a lot of investors, when they look at HHC and they've been burnt and they thought Seaport was going to be worth $2 billion four years ago, yeah. they look at it and they think it's this huge time. It's this huge sink of money. And yeah, it's, it's probably not worth the billion dollars they spent on it, but that doesn't change that it's a really good asset. And yeah. there are, they're still developing it and there's still upside to that. Anyway, hey, Bill, we have covered all the assets here, yep. right? That's $12.5 billion value. There's $6 billion of liabilities. Cool, that's book value. Nobody's going to yep. debate that. You capitalize the GNA at uh, 8% to get another billion dollars loss of GNA. Take all that out. And again, the model will be in the show links. People can go look at the model if they want. That gets you to $5.5 billion of value. That's over $100 per share in price versus the current stock price is 60. So over, over 110. Oh, I said over a hundred. It's the same. It's the same. Uh, so I think we've done a nice job covering all of the different pieces of uh, HHC's yeah. value. Let's get to, I want to do the pushback and then maybe we can wrap around to Ackman sure. at them. Look, I, I think the, the first pushback and we started to address it earlier, but yeah. the first pushback is like the nav work. You can go look at the company's history of investor days. They're always pointing to a nav that's 100, 150, and the stock price is 50, or the stock price is 100, and they point to NAV 150. And I think the first put piece of pushback a lot of people would give is, hey, this is similar to what I said with the uh, tower REITs earlier. Okay, cool. The theoretical value is there, but this is just never going to close. It just it just kind of sucks as a public market stock. Yeah, well, so so like, let me push back on that, right? People, like, like, it wasn't that long ago where if we were going to do the NAV, the nav would have been uh like like using the same model right just by changing the cap rate like like three and a half percent for multifamily which is yep. literally like what they were transacting at right and and you know like even lower like like lower than six percent for retail right like so there's a big component of that being and, and also like the purpose of me putting pegging like a 110 number to it yep. is is also like Hey, like, like I, I, you know, decisively wanted people to just say, Hey, like, 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 I think you, most people could accept this nav without a ton of pushback. Like, like, what do I personally think? I, I personally think the nav is higher than this, right? Yep. I personally think the nav is higher than this, but like, I think, and I think I we talked to... about some of the areas where you were probably pretty conservative on the, the nav in there too. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so like, like, I, I think that's important, right? It's, it's like, um, and, and I think like th there was there was like a so, so you, you have this big interest rate move and you have to incorporate that so the nap came down because of the interest rate move right and then like there's a certain element of like so so like I was having this debate with someone who's really really intelligent I, I think that the nap that that was put out there years ago was too bullish right and the nap today is too conservative right and it's the question is like did they create value in this time I think the the, the best way to determine that would be just like look at the NOI, look at the NOI, put a cap rate on it, right? And and like kind of like take away some of the debt that's associated with it. Like like it'll be very clear that to people that they create a tremendous amount of value. Let's go to the next. So that actually yeah. transitions into the next point pretty easily because I think the other thing that a lot of investors, including me, would say when they look at this thing, okay. I don't doubt the value is there, but a lot of people at this point just maybe management can execute, maybe they can't, but I think a lot of people are very skeptical on kind of capital allocation and the value ever accruing to shareholders. And I mean this in two ways. Uh, you know, there's the Seaport issue, which we've talked about a billion dollars into it. Maybe it's worth 500 million, maybe it's worth a billion, but most people think they've probably lost money on that. And some of that's outside of their control. But then there's things like, the, at, at the height of the pandemic, right, end of March 2020, they go out and they need capital, right? And how do they raise capital? They do $100 million stock issuance to the public and $500 million to Bill Ackman at $50 per share, which I think is important in context of the tenor. But, you know, a lot of people think, oh, $500 million to Bill, $100 million to public. A lot of people think they're giving him a sweetheart deal doing that, right? And then there's right now, I, I, I reread their investor day getting ready for this podcast, and they are gung-ho on their NAV and attacking the NAV discount, right? They say, hey, our NAV is way above the current share price. 
At the end of 2021, we do a $250 million repurchase in 90 days. In 90 days, we buy back $250 million at $100 per share. And guess what? We're going to keep doing that to attack the NAF. Q2, they buy back $2.2 million of stock for at $89 per share. Q3, they buy back basically no stock, and the stock is under $70 per share. And then right now, the stock is $60 per share, and they're not buying back anything because they're waiting on Ackman's tender to go through, right? So a lot of people just look at the, the capital allocation, the deals with Ackman, and they just say, this isn't a business that's going to get run for HHC's minority shareholders. They're going to bungle it through bad investments. They're not going to buy back shares at the right time, or they're going to let Ackman capture all the value. So I threw a lot out there, but I do think that okay. is people who follow this. I think that's the real concern here. Yeah, yeah. So so let me separate some of these issues. So like the the capital raised in COVID, right? Like like I think I think like you, you have to take in context in terms of like who was the executive in place today versus like who was there. So so like what was going on at the time was that uh you know Acme basically push out the the previous CEO, right? And then they had an interim CEO in place. And and ironically, I like like again, like boots in the ground. Like I was in the Woodlands, like when they were doing the Woodlands deal, right? So uh the Woodland Towers deal. So they did that deal, which like we kind of get into this actually a lot of strategic value to do that deal was actually like on a on a standalone financial basis actually makes a ton of sense. But like they 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 did the deal and then COVID happened, right? And so that was that was done when the, the in an interim CEO and they promptly like let him go, right? So can I so, just pause you? Yeah. Just what Bill's referring to is the tell me if I'm wrong. The Woodlands deal is Occidental, who at the time, people forget oil was not 100 then. Yep. Occidental was a four seller. They were over leveraged. They have a big headquarters in uh, right in Howard Hughes area. Yep. And at the end of 2019, uh, Howard Hughes strikes a $565 million deal to buy this. And, you know, COVID happens six weeks later. But I don't think anyone would say, like, this is a distressed seller. It's a strategic deal. As you said, like, nobody's going to knock that deal until COVID comes, maybe, you know, so I, I get yeah. you, but just to give that background so people yeah, know. Yeah, no, and, and, and I think it's like important. And, and, and like, like, again, like, it's like, are the capital allocation like in line with like their state of value of like, we control supply, right? Like, like the Occidental deal was going to be like 11% of all the class A. And it's actually, frankly, probably the best building in the Woodlands. So like if someone else would have came in and took over 11% supply in a market, now that someone else becomes a competitor. And I, I think this is like very, very unappreciated by the market, right? And they got like basically 8% cap rate and Oxy uh, had a 13 year, uh, you know, lease with them. So, so in that sense, like, like, and also like this is done at a much lower interest rate environment. Right. So, and so like, Oxy's investment grade, right? A 13 year, <laughs> buying 8, 8%, 13 year cap rate investment grade. Like that's a, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and so I, I think like people forget that, forget like, like don't see the strategic value. Don't see like the, the, the pure financial math behind it. You know, they were able to get like that, but like they, what, what went wrong was that the interim C, uh, you know, CEO went out and you, you know, got bridge financing for it and they got caught, you know, they got caught with a pence down in that time period. Right. So they were forced to do, they were they were forced to do you know the, the equity rates like like if you if you ask me yeah like I I absolutely hated that equity deal I hated that equity deal because one I think like one they they got themselves put in that situation right two like they probably didn't need to raise six hundred million they think like two three hundred million because they still have a decent amount of cash balance now it's a little bit Monday morning quarterback and like who who knew COVID would have turned out right and, like and, and that's the one I, I I do think it's weird that they gave you know. 80% plus of the deal to Ackman when Ackman's got this massive COVID windfall from the, the puts that he very smartly bought. But, you know, that's the one I hit them for the least because end of March, 2020, as you're saying, it's really easy to look back in hindsight and say, Hey, they, they could have just wrote it out. They, they could have recovered, but people forget it. We're pre a, we're probably oh, living yeah. in the, we're probably living in the best scenario for that, but yeah. we didn't know, like you didn't know when people were going to be oh, able to go well, to red. They literally like like days without revenue was like a thing that people talk about right like like people forget that like like gavin baker like like what what was not in your bingo car what was not in your bingo car and stress testing a company was days without revenue yeah right? like, exactly. like no one, yeah like restaurant companies nobody took 
nobody thought like these things are go- shutting down. It's like, hey, nobody can go to McDonald's. You're like, a McDonald's? You can't go to McDonald's? Yeah. The operating lease becomes all, yeah, it was just absolutely crazy. So that's the one I hate them, hit them for the least. But I do think like- So, it, so on last the buyback, year, so on the buyback, right? Now, my my NAV model, right? Like, like I, I have, you know, 110 number, but I still think it's higher, right? So when you think about like, like when I when I when I measure a company's share buyback, I don't look at the share price and then say, "Oh, you bought at this, now the stock's down here." I I look at like what is your nap? By the way, they bought they bought back at like start buyback at hundred, but like on a blended basis, I think I think the cost is ninety, right? The stock is at sixty. Again, like you Monday morning back it, but like I tend to look at the world from the perspective of. Okay, like like if your nav was was 150, which like I agree with them, and they have like if you read the JP Morgan notes, management team have privately told people that they were worth as much as 170. Well, again, like people won't believe it, right? So like from a decision making perspective, like if you really think your stock is worth 150 and as high as 170, like and you go out and you do a massive half billion dollar share buyback at 90. That makes all the sense in the world, right? I, like I'm I'm a hundred percent with you. I'm not trying to quarterback yeah. them on the stock price. What I'm trying to quarterback them on is you bought at 90 when you thought your shares were worth 170. Now your shares are at 60, so they're even cheaper. Yeah, your values probably come down yeah, but, just because but, interest yeah, so, rate, so, but they're not buying. Okay, so so on the 60, it, I mean, if you just spend a half a billion dollars, like now with the condo towers that are closing, let's see if they keep buying back shares. They didn't in Q3 though. Was that? No, they, they, did, they did buy back some, but they there's a cadence to their cash flow, right? Like, so the way that you think about this business is that like this isn't this isn't some like there's some lumpiness to their cash flow, right? So they, they have this Hawaii, you know, condo tower that they just closed, right? They'll probably get about I think like 250 million dollars of cash that comes in. Let's see what they do with that. Like like yeah. there, there's 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 I, I think that's a little bit too early to say to, to see because because yeah I, I hear you it's just you in the queues they give they give some interesting disclosure because they give post queue buyback numbers yes so you can actually see like in the Q2 queue they say hey we've bought back another 370,000 shares in July and then in the Q3 queue they say we bought back 370,000 shares in Q3 so you know they didn't buy a single share in August and September and like I don't know, I just yeah, look yeah, at that. And I say, Andrew, Andrew, again, like it go, it goes to like where does their cash to buy back shares? I know, from? I know, but you go from two point two million shares in Q two when the stock's ninety to basically zero in Q three, and then your largest shareholder who you've done a sweetheart deal with announces a tender in October. Like it just, it just looks to me bad. And I, I just look at this. I'm like, hey, why aren't they? If that's the thing, why aren't they buying back like averaging it out over the entire year instead of like blowing their whole because, load in q2 you know their their cash flow isn't this like nice but they, instead of doing 2.2 in q2 and i get like they probably thought that it was a great deal in q2 they could yeah. do a million in q2 a million in q3 and like kind of dollar cost average it over the whole year instead of just like going all at once you know I agree, right? I agree. They they probably could have like measured that out, right? And and I, I don't know, like maybe if the stock price actually was, you know, one fifty, like would we be having the same conversation today? Like like you, 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 you get what I'm saying? It's 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 it's. Let me uh, let, yeah. Let me switch from the buyback because I yeah. You you've listened to this podcast. You've been on this podcast. You know yeah. I love buyback. So that's always. Yeah. But let me ask you about some other investments, right? Like yeah. one thing I did here. From I mean, I mean, people. I I kind of want to like just put it out there, like right. like there's the I think the stock price reflects the fact that like a lot of these points that you 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 oh, bring up, there, right? There's the, absolutely the, no doubt about that. Yeah, right? there, there's like like, and, and I think like as a reference, like Ackman's COVID distress distress price was a fifty dollar deal, right? The stock is at sixty. Ackman's doing a Dutch tender offer between 52.50 to 60, right? I think the price tells you a lot about what kind of discount is being baked in into, yeah. And I think that's why you're ringing the bell here, right? You're saying yeah. like, look, Ackman bought a lot at 50 and yeah, COVID. I mean, He's I mean, trying to buy a lot at 60. Like and before yeah. you tender your shares, think about this. There is a lot of value here. And you're just trying to lay out, hey, here's where all the value is. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's like, one thing that I learned is that sometimes 
these transactions, like you're like, I, I, I effing hate them. I'm just, I'm gross out by it. But the right thing to do is to put your emotion aside and like buy because I did buy more at fifty when when, when Ackman bought during COVID, right? And, and I was I was disgusted by it. I don't like Ackman at this point, right? And 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 I like held my nose and I bought a fifty during COVID because I knew like that took away the liquidity the, the, the liquidity issues and 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 it it, it, it took away that extreme last tail risk. And if you think capital allocation, I want to talk a little more capital allocation, yeah. but if you think capital allocation has been a problem and Bill's on the board, he owns 27%. He's the control shareholder here. But guess what? After he does the tender, he's going to own 40%. He's basically the, like, he has majority control at that point. Like, control, the yes. capital allocation problems are going to go away real fast at that point. Let me just ask two more small yeah. questions on capital allocation. You know, one thing I've heard from a lot of shareholders is last year, the companies out here saying, the NAV discount, like we're really going to focus on checking the NAV discount. And then the next thing they do is they go and they buy the Arizona MPC. And I think we like MPCs, but I do think people said, hey, you're trading at a big NAV discount. You've got decades worth of inventory to go attack at Woodlands and stuff like why at Summerlin and stuff. Why are you going and getting another MPC here? You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, in a perfect world, um, I would love for these guys to just put capital, put shovels in the ground in their existing MPC, sell the land, and just use it like like TPL all the way to like multi bagger, right? Yep. Uh, because that that it, it is self funded because the the putting shovel in the ground doesn't require a lot of capital, right? And um, the um, the the Douglas Ranch, like I'll be honest with you, like I don't like that deal. It is their core competence. Like building NPCs is their core competence, right? I don't, I don't like it. Like a lot of other people, it muddies the story. It, it, you know, it is what it is. I don't have a lot of good answers to defend it. They did say that they're they're, they're expecting to sell a thousand lots, like right out of the gate. And, and I think that there's some perception that they, they need to put a lot of dollars into the infrastructure. And what the company is basically saying is that they actually don't, right? But uh, so it's yet to be seen. Like, does it does it does it like money up the narrative? Yes. Like, you know, do I have strong opinions on it one way or another? Like, not at this point. Yeah, and look, it's six hundred million. So again, it's not it's not the huge needle mover. But if you're out there saying, "Hey, we're trading at two thirds of NAV," and then you go do this big acquisition that's going to take years, like maybe it pays off, but it, it's just the capital allocation. All right, last one on capital allocation, then I do want to talk a little bit about Ackman. And then yeah. I hate talking to you guys. <laughs> we talked for a long time. Just they did an investment into the John George restaurant. They announced it at uh at the investor day. It's small, right? It was 55 million in total. No, no, the, the John George has a lot of strategic value actually. I know so. it had strategic, yeah. but I just thought like the history of real estate people investing into restaurant businesses is is not great and it's just it's weird that no, John George, so, like, doing so the i'll, building. I'll right. push back on that and we don't have the time to uh to go like to go really into it but the john george investment what what's what's unique about it is that it actually uh so 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 like what's kind of uh because i've been there a lot right like they've actually replaced the hospitality management of like melville farms and and i think david chan's restaurant to be operated under John George, right? Because it this is a very tough environment for restaurant operators, for hosp hospitality operators. And I even at these restaurants before John George took over and after John George took over, John George Hospitality Group is absolutely phenomenal in terms of providing you, you know, the service and the quality of the food, right? And and I think that there's a longer conversation is that what is a uh, like it used to be the ratio between like an office tower and the ground level retail. The ground level retail is worth way more than the office tower ab above it, right? Um, uh, for the same uh, square footage. That's changed, right? And now there's a dynamic where like there are restaurant, there are office tower owners all over the world who's, who's asking John George to say, hey, can you come and open up one of your restaurants, right? Yep. So, so it's, it's, you know, you know, they claim that it's NASA light, but but I think that investment in John George has a lot of strategic value because John, I think John George is 
very important to the success of the seaport. I, I hear you. It just, you know, as soon as Optically, I saw a real estate company bad. invest in restaurant, I, I was like, oh, it. no. Like, you know, Andrew, like, what, what good strategic decision has been like conforming like, like, like let's let's think about that at the end of the day right like if you have to make like good strategic decisions like you're probably doing something that like runs against the grain a little bit uh, let's so i think we've covered you know a lot of people had thoughts about macro and rates I, yeah i don't yes rates could keep going up like i think the cap rates you use are pretty conservative and i think you can haircut them i i don't know if you want to touch quickly on macro or rates sure, but I, I mean, I, I'll, 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 let, let's i mean so like there's there's macro there's secular there's like interest rates right like I mean, another thing we didn't talk about all day is that like there's a circular trend of people in california and northeast moving to texas and 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 nevada right so there, there's like a structural i mean this is like everyone knows this uh, there, there's, there's this big structural movement, big structural like migration to these areas. On interest rates, like I would just point out that we've looked at the maturity, right? Like there's two, almost $2 billion of general unsecured, right? Uh, that expires in 28 to 2031. And those are fixed rate, right? So you have a lot of runway before you, like in a higher interest rate environment, you have to deal with it. And you're, you generally should be able to increase you know your rent and your NOI while you have the same interest costs and then you have the latter you know you you have probably i think 40 50 different properties that are that that have you know mostly fixed rate at the property level right so like the way that they have the debt capitalized uh it you know it gives me a little, like it doesn't keep me up at night even though if, like some people have complained that it's it's too high so so i think i think i just want to point that out from a macro perspective um um, you know, it, 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 um, I think, you know, a lot of the, uh, one thing that is interesting is that like, if you look at their Q3 land sale, like everyone, the headline would be, you know, home building is in the, uh, is, is in the dumps. Like no one's buying homes anymore, but like their year over year land sale is actually higher than the year before. So, so I was kind of very positively surprised by it. I, I think, there's look higher interest rates are definitely gonna hurt right higher mortgage rates are definitely gonna hurt and that's why we bought down like you know if you look at jp morgan model they i think they have like a um i think jp morgan model for residential has um um something like um something like two three billion dollars for residential land value and and we got that at 1.6 you know we, we've like already cut you know, kind of like, you know, the heck out of it. Perfect. Okay. So last thing I want to talk about here. So we came to the, we came out of the beginning. This is the reason we're doing it, right? Ackman's, he owns 27% of this through Pershing. He's trying to get over 40% with this tender offer. I think you were just trying to lay out, Hey, the value before he tender, the value here is much, much higher. Consider this before you do, but let's talk about like, obviously Ackman's trying to buy 13% more of this because he thinks there's value here. But I do think there's an interesting thought of, hey, what are Ackman's long-term plan for yeah. HHC? So I, I just wanted to give you a second to talk about that. So I this is probably where I'm gonna sound like, you know, like like the least, you know, like 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 this is like this is not my strength. My strength is on the real estate side, like the 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 I think the um I think the issue uh like like as I thought through it. Uh, and, and by the way, thank you to your podcast because James' podcast was. I was going to mention. I, and I'll people, I like, started. People started messaging me. They're like, "Hey, like, I think Ackman's going to buy." I'm like, "What are you talking about, right?" And and I looked into it. I'm like, I looked at the Investment Company Act of 1940, and it's like you could have 40 percent securities. And guess what? Like the asset heavy, right? And it's like, what's a book value? How are you? It's like exactly 9.5 billion dollars. And and I, I think Persians like like nine like excluding cash is like nine or ten billion dollars he's got to buy more but he's got to shift some of those assets over it's like it's almost that like that 60 40 mix is almost like too much too perfect of a ratio for that to be a coincidence and just, i like just so everyone knows what bill's referring to i did a podcast with james elabar i'll include in the show notes where we talked about pershing and one of the things james talked about this is all james not me it's like look howard as bill saying howard hughes bill owns a lot if he took control of it 
this would be his way out of the 40s company act to get psh in, over to a u.s listing or something so so yeah. so like a lot of people are saying like well like why not just buy P, uh, psh you know why not just so so I, I thought about it some more and 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 my thought is okay like like uh, and, and if anyone know this better than i do please reach out right please reach out to me um uh, i'm bill at risingpartners.com please reach out uh, my understanding is that is that there, there won't be a take private right he gains control there won't be a take private and and because he needs the Howard Hughes like vehicle to stay public like like if I'm wrong people please correct me right um, he needs the Howard Hughes vehicle to stay uh, public and then at some point there, there there's going to be some sort of a merge or some 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 sort of transaction where he brings the assets from PSH Prussian Square Holdings which is traded on Euronext right because he got, I don't think he could use the Guernsey domicile vehicle and re domicile into the U S right. If I'm wrong, please, people, let me know. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I think, like, he needs – so, so like, you could kind of make an argument that he's a structural buyer here, right? And, and, and I, think, I think, like, what I'm trying to do is raise awareness so that when that does – if it does occur – and it's interesting because Prussian Square sell trades at a 30% discount to now, right? So you could take that like, – like, like, in a way, you could say, okay, like, like – like I'm, I'll be less, less like angry at Bill Ackman if like if like you know if, if the stock were higher in that merge kind of happened. like like I still won't prefer it because it will be like like I just want pure play exposure to to this vehicle like this is what I sign up for this is what I understand do I want to get more exposure like to uh, Bill Ackman's like stock picking ability like like I probably don't need that you know hey, look. I'm, so I guess the way I've kind of looked at it is it's two birds with one stone, right? The first bird is he clearly thinks HHC is undervalued, and this lets him deploy a lot of capital to buy HHC at rates that, you know, you look, he put it into, he put a, a lot of money into it at $50 per share during the height of COVID, like getting a lot more money into it at $60 per share now probably looks really attractive to him so that's the first bird but then i do think there's like a little bit of bank shot where he's saying hey at some point if i want psh to get over into the u.s and i want to you know the 1940s act and all that hhc is a perfect vehicle for that and by going from 27 percent ownership to 40 percent ownership i'm just getting a little bit closer to that bank shot too yep. so that's how i kind of look at it but look bill i think we've talked uh a ton about everything. I mean, we're, we're approaching it to our podcast. Anything we didn't hit on HHC you think we should have talked about or anything you, you wish we had hit a little harder? Uh, I don't think so, man. I think, I think, I think we cover, we cover so much. I mean, I think maybe the, the, the only thing will be like, just like, just like the near term cash inflow, you know, like if you look at the model, there's probably going to be an inflow of thirty million dollars, like between now and the year end, just from the Hawaii condos closing, right? Yep. So, so I think that's like you know at today's price, that's ten percent market cap, right? You know that that gives the company, you know, like leeway to um, to, to 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 kind of like, um, uh, you know, like 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 use that cash, you know, deploy it in a certain way. Another thing would be there's our model is based on Q2 annualized, but like they, they, a lot of Q2 annualized, like some of it is still like kind of recovering from COVID. Some of it is that those specific assets just haven't hit like the true stabilized, you know, um, that operating income. So there is like another easy half a billion dollar potential pickup just from the NOIs hitting the, the guided stabilized numbers provided by management team, right? So that's another ten dollars of upside, right? And another thing, uh, another thing is just like there's constantly like like that bucket of six hundred fifty million dollars of unstabilized. Those are all those are all going to convert into you know NOI producing cash flow producing assets. Like there's this constant stream of assets that 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 you've prepaid for but hasn't generated any cash flow. So like when you look at this, like you need to be a little bit forward looking kind of got, got to like skate to where the puck is a little bit because yep. anything that's like because like if you think about a development business you're putting up the money you're putting a shovel of ground you're developing it right but the cash flow may not show up for three four years perfect perfect well bill 
this has been great. Uh, looking forward to seeing you next week. Anybody, again, I'm going to include the link to the model in the show notes. So you, anybody who wants to go look at it can play around with it. See, like, look, I, I actually think it's pretty conservative. This is a name that's caused a lot of heartache to a lot of investors. And I, I do, I, the value's there, man. It, it's, yeah. they, oh, oh. Anyway, yeah. Bill, looking forward to seeing you next week. Yep. Appreciate you coming on. Looking forward to the fourth appearance at some point in the future. And we will uh, we'll talk I'm, I'm coming for Jeremy Raper's record, man, <laughs> at this point, you know? I'll let him know. Every time somebody says that, I let him know. And he says that nobody's taking that crown from me. But I, What's he at now, eight? I, at seven or eight. Seven or seven eight, yeah. eight. All right. I'm math free, so I don't know. I, I got a shot, all right? <laughs> talk to you soon, buddy. Okay. Yep, talk to you later. A quick disclaimer, nothing on this podcast should be considered investment advice. Guests or the hosts may have positions in any of the stocks mentioned during this podcast. Please do your own work and consult a financial advisor. Thanks.